Hi everybody, Miss Melinda here. I'm excited to do our live chat today. I'm just going to take a moment to clear the space before I get started. If I can get my lighter to work. Here we go. I'm just gonna burn some Palo Santo. Hi, thanks for joining. And I don't know how many questions I'm going to get to today in our live coaching session, our live spirit chat. Hi, thanks for joining. Because I took a couple of preliminary questions that I'm going to address first. This lighter is giving me trouble. There we go. And before I do that, before I start with those preliminary questions, I also wanted to give some reminders to people about booking with me. When you're booking with me, please be sure that you read the service description, that you understand what you are booking, that you read the instructions, and that you follow the instructions, that you put your details, your personal details, your full, hi, how are you? Thanks for joining. That you put your full personal details, your full name, your date of birth, and the goals for your services in the order comments when you book. Also, if you're booking a reading with me, it's, well, for all the services, this is important, but it's especially important when you're booking a reading with me, please be sure that you pay attention to your email and that you read thoroughly the follow-up email or the schedule confirmation that I send you and that you follow the instructions there. For example, for a text reading, I'm going to send really specific instructions. Hi, thanks for joining. For a text reading, for example, I will send really specific instructions about when your reading will take place and how to proceed with that reading. For a phone reading, I will send you schedule information that gives you options of um, your schedule date in your own time zone. So communication is really important. Please make sure that you read the services. Please understand what you are booking with me. Follow the instructions that I have taken the time to write on my website. Check your email, read the emails that I send to you, and please follow the instructions and communicate well. It helps everything go smoothly. And it helps me stay organized so that I can best serve you. Whew, okay. That Palo Santo feels nice. I'm glad you're here, Niaja. So, for um, like I was saying, before I start taking questions today, I'm going to answer a few of the questions that have already been submitted to me. And the first question that was submitted to me was, do I have a problem speaking Spanish? The only problem that I have speaking Spanish is that I am not fluent in Spanish. <laughs> I, I'm not conversational in Spanish. Um, I wasn't raised in Texas. I was raised in Michigan. I had one year of Spanish in junior high. Um, what little I picked up from that class, I probably have lost. I am picking up a lot more on Spanish because I'm submerged in it now and when you're around a language it is easier to pick up on it so I can understand quite a bit of Spanish and I can read it and I can understand it for the most part but I can't I can't speak it I'm not conversational so if you want to converse with me on the phone or in a video, I won't be able to speak Spanish, but if you want to send me an inquiry or, you know, write me an email and you need to do that in Spanish, I can definitely translate. So that's that. Um, the other question that I received was how to know if you are a reader or if you have a calling to be a reader. So there's quite a bit of information that I could say about that. The thing is, I'm also wondering if the question was pertaining to being a tarot reader or being another kind of reader because there's a lot of kind of readings that can be performed on behalf of others. There's a lot of kinds of psychic readings. There's, um, there's a lot of different things. So I'm going to take it to mean card readings and I'm also going to um, kind of generalize in my reply so that it could apply to all kinds of different reading services on behalf of others. The first thing is, 
a lot of people who have a calling to do that kind of work or this kind of work are very compassionate people. They're people who have a lot of empathy. They are people who sometimes they are empaths. They are people that other people naturally seek out to tell their problems to. If you find that throughout your life you have been somebody that other people like to talk to, that you're somebody that's easy to talk to for other people, if people you don't even know come up to you and want to tell you about their problems, if the people in your life um, regularly seek you out for advice and value your opinion, if you are able to easily give insight to others or to see patterns that other people don't necessarily see or can't necessarily put together, um, that those are some of the characteristics that would be typical of a reader or somebody called to do that kind of um, guidance work for others. Some of the other things would be um, just having a, a natural, like feeling naturally called to, to whatever, um, whatever tool or whatever process that you would use for the readings. So this is when it be, does that always happen to you? Isn't that crazy? So that, um, th this is where things get a little bit abstract because, um, you would either be have a natural ability towards like some kind of psychic ability or you would have a, a natural or organic calling towards tarot cards or pendulums or oracles or um, runes or uh, you know any of those things so it's if you feel the natural calling if you have a strong intuition and you just feel that it's right for you in your body if you want to learn tarot cards or some other kind of divination. It doesn't necessarily have to be about having a calling and performing on behalf of other people. It can be that you know you just want to explore that for yourself. So, it so you if you want to learn it for any reason, you can learn, and it. it doesn't have to be some big deal like um, you know I should only do this if I have a calling. If you want to do it, you should do it. If it feels right to you, you should do it. There are a lot of different kinds of ways to read tarot cards. For example, if you want to use them for your own self-development, your own meditation purposes, your own self-growth, then it's an excellent tool for yourself and it's an excellent tool to lead you into reading for other people, especially because if you're using them the, the right way and you're applying them in a proactive and positive way, then it's going to help you grow. It's going to help you learn. It's going to help you reflect on human experiences, human emotions, and the patterns that we go through on this journey through life. And therefore, doing that work on yourself and having those reflections is going to help you work on behalf of others eventually when you are ready. Um, if the person who asked that question is here, and you have any follow-up questions about that, then please do let me know. I'm gonna take a drink of water and think if there's anything else I wanna say about that before I move on to the next question that I received. A lot of people who have callings to do readings on behalf of other people or to work in any kind of guidance capacity for other people not only have strong empathy and strong compassion and are good listeners and have a lot of life experience, a lot of um, interesting experiences that they've been through, interesting challenge that they've, challenges that they've been through that have helped them understand things from a bigger perspective, but they also oftentimes have some kind of very strong intuition or... Sorry about that, guys. I got a call. If I blacked out for a moment, that was a phone call coming in. Um, so they either usually have some kind of really strong intuition or some other kind of really strong spiritual gift or psychic ability. And that's going to work for you however it works for you because there are a lot of different ways to have spiritual gifts or psychic abilities. So that's another thing to look out for. If you tend to just know things about people or when someone is telling you something about their problem or something about their life or some kind of question or question that they have or challenge that they're facing and you just kind of can see how it's going to work out or you can see the problems that they can't see. You can see 
um, you know the psychological or emotional motivations going on um, in the other people in this person's lives like if you can see those kinds of things very easily and clearly then that is a good indication that you would be good at doing that kind of work okay I think I've said everything I wanted to say about that the other question that I had as a um, preliminary question was about working with ancestors. I'm not taking Q&A yet, but in a little while I will be. I'm just answering some questions that I got um, previously before this started. So the other question that I got, it, got <laughs> was about doing ancestor work and how to build a stronger connection with ancestors. So in a lot of the, there's a kind of unifying um, belief or um, there's a unifying belief among many traditions that you should start very simply and from a very quote unquote pure perspective when working with your ancestors. I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of a beginner even though the person who asked me this question is not a beginner and that way I'm going to cover all bases and hopefully this will be useful for other people as well. So. In the beginning, especially if you don't have any experience working with any kinds of spirits, um, then what you would do is approach this from a very pure perspective. And that means that you do a lot of spiritual purification for yourself, you do a lot of um, protection work for yourself, and you take a lot of precautions that prevent any kind of unwanted energies or entities to interfere with the connection and the relationship that you are working on building with your ancestors. Some of those precautions would be that you cover your altar or your table or your place on the floor. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as a mat on the floor, but whatever you use, cover it in white or use white only. One simple white candle is enough and a glass of water or a small bowl or dish of water. That's all that you need to start building your relationship with your ancestors. If you want to go a little bit further than that, then you can put up some pictures of your ancestors around your space or around your altar, but you may want to wait to do that until you develop a relationship with somebody or until you know um, who is most likely to be offering you guidance or offering you communication from your from your ancestor realm and then this basically just takes a lot of patience a lot of dedication and consistency it's really important that you go to that space or that altar at the same time you don't need pictures right away you you may want to wait to use pictures so the First most important thing is that you go to that space or that altar at the same time, whether that's the same time of the week or the same time of the day. And if you choose just one day of the week that you're going to do this, then do it at the same time on that day of the week every time. So, you know, first thing in the morning, for example, or whatever it may be, but it needs to be very consistent. Go to that place and consistently state your intentions to make a connection with your ancestors. State a connection to make a, a clear connection with an ancestor who is interested in entering a relationship with you, which is mutually beneficial for the purpose of spiritual evolution. Why? Because when you enter a relationship with an ancestor, not only are they able to help you spiritually evolve, but you also can help them spiritually evolve. And it's important that you have that, um, that, that you have, that you make that intention clear and that you put forth that effort to help them and that you make, you make it clear that you understand that you respect them, that, let them know that you respect them, that you think everything that they've, you are thankful for everything that they've done before you. You're thankful for everything that you've inherited them, that inherited from them, even if you don't know what those things are. You're thankful for all of the challenges and the problems that they have faced 
regardless if you know about them or not. You're thankful that they've cleared that path before you. You're thankful for everything that you've inherited from them. Understanding that a lot of which or some of which you may have inherited from them you don't know about because this gets into um, other philosophies and other belief systems but we have cellular we have cellular memory we have memory in our DNA so we've inherited memories of experiences from our ancestors and these are the kinds of things that we're thanking them for the ways that they have offered us strength and growth through actions and occurrences and challenges that we ourselves have not had to face, that they've faced before us. The things that they have done in their lives that have helped pave the way for us in our life now, regardless if we know what those things are or not. Um, the wisdom that we have inherited from them, the unique traits and characteristics and also making sure that we are approaching them in a way that is of reverence, of respect, of honor. Telling them, you will always have a place in my heart, you will always have a place in my home. And the word duty keeps coming to my mind. It's not the exact word that I want to use, but I'm going to use it um, in lieu of a better word. But being sure that you make it clear that you understand you have a duty to them to um to continue the connection to continue the connection in your family line to continue your responsibility towards your elders to um to honor them for for all that they have done all of the things i've just mentioned and then recognizing that through some of them may still need healing and some of your family that is alive may need healing. And working together, you being the, um, the channel or the conduit or the um, interceder between your living family and your family that has passed on, you can facilitate this healing with the help of the spirit world. So these are, th this is just some of the, um, background knowledge that you should have going into your ancestor work going into creating these relationships so that this this is informing your attitude this is informing your intention this is informing your reasons for going to your ancestors right so getting down to the more of the the basic everyday stuff you just want to go to them consistently and tell them consistently some of the things that I have just said in your own words and let them know that you wish to create a strong connection with them, that you respect them, that you wish to seek their guidance, that you wish to create a connection. Do not ask them for anything in the beginning. Simply show them honor, offer them gratitude, and cons consistently give them those very simple offerings. Um, and then after you have expressed your honor, ex expressed honor for them, expressed the gratitude, expressed um, your intentions towards the relationship, then you can sit back and just talk to them like you would any other person, any other friend, or any other family member. Um, talk to them about your life, talk to them about what's going on with you, but don't ask them for any specific guidance, don't ask them for any specific help, don't ask them to do anything for you until something in that relationship changes and you know that they someone one of your ancestors or more are making a strong connection with you you if you are tuned in with your intuition or tuned in with your spiritual gifts or your psychic abilities whatever it may be if you're very tuned in with that practice as well then you will know when something has shifted in the relationship you'll know when they're making their presence known to you if you're somebody who tends to receive messages and dreams then that's the way you will receive it if you're somebody who tends to have visions then you'll have a vision if you can see spirits then maybe you will see them in your home for example so when that relationship does shift then you will be able to ask them for specific guidance for specific insights and even for help with challenges in your life. I urge you, you, 
not to go to them for everything and anything under the sun. You can talk to them about your life as much as you want, but don't go to them to help you with every little thing or help you beat every enemy that you think you have or help you do all of your spell work or help you get, you know, every job that you want. It's um, be respectful. Don't overtax them. Don't go to them and expect them to do everything and anything in your life and fix your whole life. Ask them instead to give you guidance so that you can see what you need to change within yourself so that you can fix your life. Ask them to offer you strength. Ask them to offer to assist you with being open to receiving their guidance, with being open to understanding their wisdom so that you have the tools that you need to face your challenges and fix your life. Um, the other thing is be sure that, so I like to make a distinction between ancestor worship and ancestor veneration. For me personally, I would not worship an ancestor. I would never say ancestor worship. An ancestor is not a deity. An ancestor is not a, a demigod. An ancestor is not um, an inter, well they can be an interceder between us and God. Yes, I believe that they can. Okay, so anyway, ancestors, remember, they were humans. They were here on the human plane. Depending on how long ago they lived, depending on um, what their soul journey is, depending on a number of factors that we maybe can or cannot know about, they are in different stages of spiritual evolution or soul evolution themselves. Most of them are not going to be highly elevated spirits. Perhaps some of them are, and perhaps one of these highly elevated spirits will come to you, and you will know when that happens, but they're not all going to be highly elevated spirits who, you know, it, 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 we're not talking about spirit guides, like high level spirit guides who have never been incarnated, for example. We're, ancestors are not like that. Um, and they have different tasks after they pass on, right? Um, each soul, each person has different tasks to achieve. And some of those tasks may or may not involve helping us out with guidance. So what I'm trying to say is to take all of the context into consideration of the fact that you may or may not know what kind of um, evolution they are going through. You don't know what their journey is. You don't know what their lessons are and what their responsibilities are and what they have agreed to take on or not. Also take into factor their personality when they are, were alive. So they are, <clears throat> unless they lived a long, long time ago and they've had a chance to go through a lot of evolution, like let me just stop and say those are the kinds of ancestor spirits that are most often um, contacted in shamanic practice. So that's a different thing than exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the possibility of um, communicating with or making a relationship with all kinds of different ancestors, even someone who may have passed on last year. So anyway, um, also take into consideration their personality. Whatever they were interested in and whatever they were knowledgeable about, whatever they were into, whatever they were like when they were on earth, if you knew them, then those are the kinds of things that you should expect from them now, especially if it's someone who has died recently, someone that you've already known. The chances are um, they are not gonna have changed overnight even though they have passed on. Maybe they have some more information than they did when they were alive, but we can't make that assumption until they show that to us. Um, so, you know, some, some ancestors may, they're going to be more interested in the things that they are more knowledgeable about. Um, ancestors who have recently passed, they're going to be able to give you advice and guidance about things in your everyday life because they remember what it's like to experience those kinds of things. Um, ancestors who've lived a long time ago and have had time to spiritually evolve, they're going to be the ones who are more likely to give you spiritual guidance or guidance about your own spiritual evolution, um, things of that nature. Um, you know, let's say that your grandpa was a mechanic and he was interested in wrestling and he rode a motorcycle and smoked marble cigarettes. I'm throwing some details in there about my actual grandpa. Um, 
<laughs> and he died just a couple of years ago, you're not going to call him up, metaphysically speaking, and ask him to help you with practicing magic. Ask him to help you learn techniques of candle magic and how to make that magic work. He's going to be like, I don't know. Why don't you ask me about motorcycles or, you know, truck driving or whatever it is. So that's the kind of thing I'm getting around to. But let me drive the point home. Don't ask them for a bunch of stuff um, in general, but don't ask them for anything until you've really built that connection. All right. I have answered all of the questions and now I would love to, I keep getting calls, sorry guys. So now I would love to open this up to your questions. And as usual, you can ask me anything about spiritual practice or spiritual development, magical practice, all kinds of things. I'm here to do a mini coaching session with you and I am happy to take your questions and answer them to the best of my ability. Also, happy belated equinox. I don't know about you, but I am really feeling lighter and like things are starting to really move forward a lot more now that the equinox has come. Um, also, happy early full moon tomorrow. It's a full moon in Aries. You will know which ancestors are working with you when they send you signs after you have built that relationship and they have really started to come to you. So like I was saying earlier about how it's going to work for you depending on what your most, uh, what your strongest gifts are or what your, um, what spiritual gifts you're most tuned into, that's how you're going to receive those messages. You have to look for signs and look for messages. And when you communicate with them, make sure that you tell them or when you pray to them or whatever, make sure you tell them, please send me messages, signs, and guidance in a way that I as an individual can understand and in a way that I can understand on the human plane. And that's going to help a lot in the way that they communicate to you. So like if you usually get messages in your dreams or um, then you would be most likely to see them in your dreams. If you usually see signs when you're out about in the world like in, in nature, in clouds or through animals or on billboards and license plates, then that's how you may receive a message. There are lots of different ways to receive those messages and figure out who is working for you. Hold on guys, you may have to repeat these. There Also, there's something else that I wanted to mention earlier. You may want to get a reading with somebody that you really trust in order to determine which ancestor you should start working with first. I have had three different readers tell me that I should work with a specific ancestor. And because all three people didn't know each other and they all came up with strong messages from a specific ancestor of mine who I already felt strongly connected to, that was really helpful for me in building that relationship that may be something useful for other people to look into as well. Okay, is it okay to use two spirits, goddesses, for the same candle work? That really depends on if those spirits or goddesses get along with each other, if they um, are ones that already have like a relationship with each other and they get along with each other. And also I would really make sure that you're giving specific offerings to each of them and really being distinctive about offering them each gratitude and offering them each energy. Which ancestor work can you call upon a certain ancestor just to, with ancestor work can you call upon a certain ancestor just to have a relationship yeah and no guidance just to have a relationship and no guidance most definitely and that's based that's what you should spend most of your time working on and that's what you should spend a long time working on before you would even ask for guidance anyway but the thing is the guidance is gonna come naturally they're, if they're interested in having a relationship with you, then they're interested in your spiritual evolution. They're interest in your, interested in your progress through life. And they are going to send you signs and guidance and information about um, decisions that you need to make or ways to handle things, um, things that are going on in your life, etc. So 
whether or not you ask for it, if you build a strong relationship with an ancestor, you're going to get the guidance. But it's fine and it's great to not ask for any guidance and not ask for any help. And I have, um, I have spirits and ancestors that I work with who I typically don't ask anything of. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else have questions about your spiritual development, your spiritual practice, your folk magic, your candle work, your magical practice, developing your divination, developing your psychic powers, your intuition, your spiritual gifts, and everything in between. I can also answer questions about energy work, meditation, etc. Yeah, I saw that you mentioned something earlier about your reconciliation work, and I said, I think that you said something about Oshun. Who else are you working with, or who, who are the two deities or entities that you're working with in, in regards to your reconciliation work? You can discard candle wax in any variety of ways. You can put it in the garbage if you want. And you can say a prayer when you put it in the garbage. Some people work with spirits of the garbage. In some traditions, there are spirits that live in the dump. Um, I guess that's a story for another time. So there's lots of different ways that you can discard of candle wax. In a lot of traditions, especially um, very traditional witchcraft, you would make a charm bag out of the remnants from your spell work. You would save some of the candle wax or maybe all of the candle wax and some of the other remnants like perhaps the herbs used and you can wrap them up in a paper packet or you can put them in a charm bag and then you would keep them around to help um, manifest your spell or help continue the energy of your spell. And there are a lot of different things that you can do with that packet or that charm bag. For instance, if you were working on um, reviving your love relationship or reviving your marriage, you might put that packet or that charm bag underneath your mattress and sleep with it. If it was a spell for um, increasing your psychic ability or increasing your spiritual connection, you might put that charm bag or packet in under your pillow and sleep with that by your head. Um, if it is a spell to get rid of things that you don't want around, then you need to dispose of those remnants far away from your house in a dumpster far away. Oh, St. Martha, St. Martha and Oshun. Yeah, but those are both deities that really, um, deities or spirits that really like to have their own reverence and that are really going to want to have their own respect, their own honor, and their own offerings. It's okay to work with both of them, but I wouldn't necessarily do it together. I would make sure to distinguish between the two. I would make sure to distinguish um, that you're paying respect to them individually, that they don't necessarily work together. They don't have a relationship. Um, and I would maybe even set some make sure that you set some like give one of give them candles in separate areas of your altar or in on a uh, or in separate areas of your table whatever you're working on just make it distinct and i would maybe um get a candle that's dedicated to just one of them or both of them and kind of consider that two or three separate spells or two or two or three separate workings because I know you've got your honey jar work right so you might want a vigil candle for Oshun and a vigil candle for Saint Martha and those three things to be separate from each other then you could burn a different candle on top of your honey jar work let me know you so you are giving them different offerings and giving them undivided attention so that sounds great it sounds like you're doing a good job i would do a bit more research about their relationship so what i was going to say i have a question about petition paper after your candle is fully bur burned down you can burn your petition paper in a lot of um traditions that is considered good luck for the petition paper to be fully burned to ash then that is considered that you're 
your prayers have been heard, that the smoke from, from that petition paper is going up, and in that way your prayers are being carried, they're being heard. Um, otherwise, you can recycle it, or you can put it in the garbage, like I was saying earlier. Okay, great. It sounds like you're doing perfectly with that. So like I was saying earlier, there's a different way, a lot of different ways to dispose of remnants from your spells or workings. And if it's something that you've been working on getting rid of or some kind of cleansing work like spiritual cleansing, spiritual purification, or banishing something or like getting rid of blockages, getting rid of obstacles, anything like that, then you want to dispose of that far away from your home, whether it's wax remnants or paper petitions. Put it in a dumpster or garbage that's somewhere far away from your home. Um, if it's something for bringing in prosperity, bringing in abundance or money, bringing in peaceful energies or blessings or any kind of good luck to your home or your family, then you can put it in a container and bury it. Not a container, but more like a bag, something like that, like a charm bag or a packet like I was mentioning earlier and bear it, bury it next to your front door or somewhere in your yard. Meditations, affirmations. Can you talk about how to use hell notes? Yeah, I use hell notes. I usually call them spirit money. Um, I have a really extensive YouTube video about the, the history and use of spirit money, but it talks a lot about history and it's a little bit um, heavy on the history. So I can talk more about how to use spirit money. There's a lot of different ways. Um, and actually, hi, thanks for joining. Actually, I have a really favorite spell that I like to use with spirit money for bringing in prosperity and abundance, bringing in money. And what I like to do is get one of those um, bank deposit envelopes and from, from my credit union or from your bank and put spirit money in them. Write your petitions on the spirit money, write your date of birth, um, write your petitions, your full name and your date of birth on the spirit money and pack one of those envelopes full of spirit money, representing all of the abundance that you're bringing to yourself. And then use that packet in conjunction with, with other things. Like um, I've used it in conjunction with a prosperity lamp. I've used it in conjunction with a, um, a, pros a prosperity jar, a sweetening jar for money, or you can put it underneath a candle. So spirit money is really useful in money related spells or workings, things um, related to bringing in monetary abundance and financial prosperity. It represents money. So that's a very useful, that's called sympath sympathetic magic. When we use a symbol of what we want to draw into our life to actually draw it into our life, it works on the principle of like attracts like. So that's one thing that spirit money is good for. You can also simply write your petition on it and then burn it. But when, you know, really honor spirit money though, because the tradition and the history behind it is that it's used as an offering and it's used as an offering to ancestors and high level deities. So whenever I burn spirit money, I consider it an offering to ancestors. And you can definitely, you can definitely send your petitions to your ancestors, but taking into consideration everything that we've just talked about, about building those relationships with, with your ancestors, it's not always, always appropriate. So when you're working for money, you may also want to burn your spirit money with your petition on it as an offering to a spirit or a deity or guardian spirit or whatever, whoever it is, guardian angel that you're working with. It can be an offering to any of those. Um, what are some other ways to use spirit money? I like to put them in sweetening jars when the jars are for prosperity. When you are using, if you just want to revere your ancestors, then you can set up a space to offer your spirit money. You want a whole packet of it. You're not just going to give them like two. Traditionally, it's a whole packet. and. Um, when you get the traditional packs, they actually come 
with other paper wrapper, wrapped around them like in a bundle and you're supposed to burn the whole bundle at a time. But you don't, you don't have to do it precisely that way, but I'm just saying give them a whole packet and you may want to do this outside, like start a fire outside, whether it's in a container or you know whatever it is that you have available to you, but be safe always when you're using fire. And it's traditional to always lay it down nicely. You don't just light it on fire and throw it around. Um, lay it down with reverence, lay it down with honor, lay it down together, don't crumple it up, and you know say some prayers when you light it and burn it up and watch it, watch the smoke go up. Um, this is another one where it's preferred that it's going to be completely burned to ashes, right? Then that's a, a sign that um, your prayers, your honor, your offerings are being received. If you have any other questions about spirit money, let me know. And we are on the part of our chat now where I'm taking your q and I'm, I'm taking your Q, I'm giving you A. <laughs> I'm taking your questions about anything related to spiritual development, um, your spiritual practice, developing your intuition, developing your divination practice, um, working magic, folk magic, developing your relationships with your ancestors, your spirit guides, your guardian angels, um, your meditation practice, developing your psychic abilities, your spiritual gifts, etc. We've talked about a lot so far. We've covered a lot of good territory. Thank you to those of you who have submitted questions in advance. I enjoyed those questions. I enjoyed talking about ancestors especially. And thanks for taking the time to do that and for asking interesting questions. And thank you to all of you who have joined today and thank you to all of you who have asked questions so far. I always enjoy talking with you. I always enjoy answering your questions. It's nice for me to think about these topics. It's nice for me to refresh myself on these topics and it's nice to have the discussion. So I'm happy to help you. <clears throat> Can I recommend any books? Or do I have any favorite books about or about working with spirits, angels, or positive magic? I don't. <laughs> um, I don't. Let me think about that. You know who I like? I like Judica Isles. I'm not sure if you pronounce her name with the S or if the S is silent. So Judica Isle or Judica Isles. And I have a couple of her books that I really like. One is the um, an Elements Encyclopedia of 5,000 Spells. You're welcome. And one is um, something about like everyday spells for right now or something like that. But uh, my point is she wrote a book. It's another like encyclopedia book that she put together and it's about spirits and um, angels and things of that nature. You might So you might wanna look up her. That might be a good place for you to get started. I mean, <clears throat> when you say books about positive, positive magic, there, there's all kinds of books, but the thing is most books about magic are going to offer you positive and negative because life has a lot of, um, life is not black and white um, and a lot of people coming from a magical or spiritual perspective don't see things in black and white so it's not always about good or bad, it's also about accepting everything that's in between. Um, that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to, I don't really have any books that are specifically like what you're talking about and to be quite honest I haven't read a ton of books about working with angels, spirits, and things of that nature. A lot of what I do has come to me pretty um, naturally and has been learned through experience. Um, there is another little book that I have called The Good Witch's Guide and you might enjoy that. It has a lot about um, like white magic and healing magic and things like that in it. It's not totally my cup of tea, but it has some interesting information about herbal magic and things that I do enjoy. But it's got a lot of stuff, so, so look that one up and see if you like it. Um, and then I have a couple of other books that I typically recommend for like 
working with spirit guides that you might be interested in. And those books are in the other room and I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I do have a YouTube video where I recommend those books. So if you email me and drop me a line when we're done with this, then I'll send you a link to that YouTube video or you can go on my YouTube channel and look for that video yourself. And if you don't know how to search me, it's Miss Melinda's Metaphysical Services. And if you don't know how to email me, there is an email button on my Instagram page and it's a little link that says email. It's blue, it's right beneath the highlights, right beneath those circular highlights. You can just click that and it sends you right to emailing me. Hi, for those of you who have just joined, we are on to the portion of our talk where I am happy to answer your questions. Anything about spiritual development, developing your spiritual practice, developing your spiritual abilities, developing your intuition, your psychic abilities, your divination practice, your meditation practice, working with spirit guides, working with guardian spirits, working with ancestors, and all kinds of things in between, practicing folk magic, candle magic, etc. So, hi Elizabeth, you're here. So feel free to, oh, Faith and Encouragement is here. Hi, thank you for joining. I hope you're doing good, Elizabeth. So feel free to ask any questions. How can I strengthen my connection with my spirit guides? Love your page, thank you. Um, strengthening your connection with your spirit guides is going to depend greatly upon how your spiritual gifts or how your um, abilities work for you. You're going to want to focus on the way that you most readily receive messages or receive spiritual connection or receive guidance. And you're going to want to work on developing those tools within yourself. Um, for instance, if you, you know, if you see visions, if you're clairvoyant, then you're going to work, want to work on strengthening your clairvoyance. Um, any way that you can receive messages and that you can communicate with your guides uh, is going to be a great way for you to receive more from them. Working on those skills with yourself is going to be a great way for you to strengthen that connection and receive more from them. Another way that you can strengthen your connection with your guides would be to set up a very consistent, regular practice where you speak to them and contact them without fail. It needs to be consistent. Um, pick one day of the week or one time of day and do it at the same time every time and continually express that you are grateful for them, that you want to make a connection, that you seek to strengthen your connection with them, that you seek to walk with them, that you seek to strengthen your relationship. Do it over and over again as long as it takes and then make sure that you pay attention to the signs that you receive. Um, I find it really helpful that after you say those prayers, after you offer that um, reverence to them, you take some time to really sit quietly by yourself and pay attention. Just stay there after in the same place after saying the prayers or communicating with them and sit quietly, close your eyes and pay attention and see if you receive any insights. See if any sudden intuitions come to you. Make sure that you're actually waiting and listening to find and to hear the guidance that you're asking for. Regular meditation is also another way to strengthen your connection with your spirit guides, especially any kind of meditations that are specifically aimed at making connection with your spirit guides. So that can be guided meditations or it can be meditations that you've learned how to do on your own to help you journey to your guides. There are some really interesting books. Hi Brooke, thanks for joining. There are some really interesting books that I recommended earlier that I have a video about uh, on my YouTube page that would be really helpful for you in making a connection with your spirit guides. If you drop me an email after this, I'll send you the link or you can look for it on my YouTube page. I already mentioned all of that information earlier if you need to know about it. I already talked a bunch about um, Ancestors Brook. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you can rewatch the video when it's done and that you enjoy that, that portion. That was fun.
You're welcome. Okay, anybody, everybody, anybody, I'm here to answer your questions about spiritual development, spiritual practice, practicing magic, candle magic, book magic, divination, the tarot, meditation, spirit guides, ancestors, guardian spirits, guardian angels, <laughs> all of that stuff. Yeah, thank you, thank you. For those of you who weren't here earlier, I was mentioning before that I feel a lot lighter now that the autumn equinox has passed. Something about going into this season actually feels really refreshing. My spirit guides have been contacting me in my dreams as well. Incredibly lucid and vivid dreams, but they are very metaphorical. How do I decipher, decode them? Well, you have to decode the metaphors. <laughs> if you know that they're metaphors, then you already have a clue about how to decode it. So the thing about dreams and the thing about our spirit guides um, and our ancestors, etc., is that they're going to speak to us in the unique language that only we have. So just like we all vibrate at a unique vibration, we're all indi unique individuals vibrating at our own vibration, we all have our own spiritual language and learning that language is how you're going to decipher these codes. I'm going to need these questions repeated in a moment. Um, learning that language is how we're going to decipher those codes. Um, so you have to think about what the symbols in your dreams mean to you specifically based upon either your own spiritual beliefs or your own personal experiences, your own memories, things that have occurred in your life, or just what your own personal meaning is. That's why, you know, a lot of times dream books and, and things like that aren't really that helpful. They're very generalized when really these symbols that come to us in our dreams are very personal to us. I was, I was doing some research about dream work not too long ago. And there are some really interesting perspectives on it, and I was just trying to see if I could reiterate some of those perspectives. And it's really helpful to dissect your dream and the symbols in it piece by piece. And then, you know, think about, put it in first person perspective. Like you're in a church by yourself. So then you would say, I'm alone. I'm in a church. What does it mean to you to be in a church? I'm alone in a place of worship. I'm alone in a place of God. Is God, you know, so then you would get some ideas about, okay, one of the themes is being alone or being isolated or being independent, depending on how you feel in the dream. Did you feel positive or did you feel scared? Did you feel independent or did you feel alone, right? So I'm alone and I'm communicating with God or I'm alone and you know I, things of that nature it's like you have to break it down segment by segment symbol by symbol like you're in the water so you're in the water with a group of friends I'm in a crowd I'm surrounded I'm submerged I'm surrounded and submerged does that mean that I feel like I'm drowning in my life being surrounded and submerged does that mean that i'm um that i'm throwing myself into things that um that there's a wall up around me etc you have to dissect it in that way put your take each individual segment of the dream each symbol each feeling and then learn how to format your story out of it okay so there are some questions that i missed because i really wanted to get a little bit deeper into this dream stuff um, so could you please repeat them? I know Brooke was one of them. I know there was another question about the reconciliation work or the love work or the honey jar. And then I think I saw one more. So if you all could repeat those questions, I would be happy to answer them. And I also wanted to say, you know, I don't, I don't interpret dreams for you, but I do offer a service to help you analyze your dreams if needed. Oh, thanks. I always forget that I can scroll. 
Is it possible that you had spell work done and instead the love spell brought in someone new? Yeah, definitely, especially if you weren't super specific about it or if the person who did it wasn't super specific about it or if the universe was just like or spirit was like, well, that love isn't good for you, that relationship isn't good for you, but because you're asking, you're asking so intently for love and I'm receiving that message, I'm going to go ahead and send you one that is good for you. That's definitely a thing that happens. Okay, Brooke, I don't know if you talked about this yet, but do you prefer to have an ancestor altar separate from your other altars? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I do prefer to, and a lot of different traditions um, also have that preference. That is a, a very traditional thing to have a separate ancestor altar. My spirit guides have been contacting me in my dreams as well. Okay, good. I already saw that one. All right. Oh, thanks for repeating that, Brooke. Sorry, I always forget that I can scroll to see the questions. And I, you weren't here, but I was saying that Ancestor Altar, um, it doesn't need to be elaborate. It, it can be very simple. And actually, oftentimes, it's preferred to be very simple just covered in white. It can even be a white cloth on the floor. It can even be just on the floor without a cloth or without a placemat or anything. In some traditions, they like to, they prefer to put it on the floor. And you don't need pictures or anything, but when you start to build that relationship and you want to go deeper, or you want things to be more elaborate, then pictures of your ancestors can be really helpful, but it's not necessary and it may not be preferred in the beginning until you really know who you're developing those strong relationships with or who you want to develop those strong relationships with. But it's important to make the distinction that who you want to develop a relationship with may not want to develop a relationship with you and someone that you or may not be able to that that's also a thing um and but someone that maybe you don't even know or haven't even thought of maybe they are the ones who end up wanting to or or building that relationship with you so um there's a lot of reasons why it may not be good to to actually focus on specific ancestors or have those pictures there in the beginning. Okay, so you've been learning tarot. Awesome. How do you know what they mean and in what context? I know most of their meanings, but I can decipher what they mean together. Any tips? You're welcome, Brooke. Yeah, let me think about this. Let me think about how I could ex Okay, third call I've received during our live today. Um, sorry about that, guys. All right, so the way that I read the tarot is very much intuitively. And um, if you look at the cards, like the symbols and the images on the cards are telling you a story, those pictures are telling you a story, then you, you can look at them. If you can do that individually, then you can do that together. Because the cards are very much, like they're not, their, their meanings are meant to change based upon what the question is, based upon what the context is, and based upon which cards are around them. So it, it is important to be able to, to know how they influence each other. Um, that's something that I'm not really sure how I can explain it in words over a video. It's something that I could definitely coach you on learning on your own and developing, but to just to to simplify that without being able to really teach it to you is more difficult. Just remember that the cards tell a story. They tell a story, and they're um, the story is going to change based on the context. You know. Um, yeah, maybe in a little bit I'll get out some cards and show some examples, but right now I'm going to answer a couple of other questions. And also remember that you're using your intuition and you're using your gifts with the cards. It's not just about um, the definition of the cards. And it, it's about the, the guidance that is needed either, you know, for yourself or for somebody else. And it's about your gifts, your intuition, and the feeling that you get, 
and it's about the images on the cards and how those cards are communicating to you. Yeah, it's about a lot more than the definition of the cards. So just my, my biggest um, advice would be to use your intuition. I guess I have 27 seconds remaining. You've been having a dream where there is a severe flooding, but you're always safe and floating in a boat or some, something similar. It can mean spiritual um, advancement. It can mean that you're developing your, your intuition. It can mean that